No man in public life was ever more human than Sir John. Known as Old Man Tomorrow, he was the first Canadian to say, I am a Canadian. We remember him today as the man who put this great country together, a man who was able to bring together jarring elements and achieve agreement. How he was able to achieve this was in large measure due to his incredible ability to temper truth with humor and to use wit for the maintenance of a sense of proportion. A soft answer, it has been said, turneth away wrath. In MacDonald's case, a humorous one sometimes increased it, but in any event, reduced the argument to reasonable proportions. So what I'm going to do is to tell you some stories about Sir John, to show you how human old tomorrow was. I recall one incident that one of his cabinet ministers, Darcy McGee, difficulties had arisen. McGee began to drink. Sir John said to him, I have no objection to anything that my cabinet does under ordinary circumstances, but I want to point out that there is no room in my cabinet for two drunks. Everyone who's been Prime Minister of Canada has had the experience. Whenever a senator becomes ill or is reported in the press, immediately letters are received. You can be sure of them the next day. They generally read something like this. I'm deeply concerned over the fact that Senator A is ill. I do hope he'll recover. But if in God's grace he does not, I would be prepared to accept an appointment so that Canada may be able to continue, even in a larger field, to have the benefit of my service and experience. MacDonald used to attend all the funerals of members of Parliament or Senators. He liked funerals, providing he was fortified to enjoy them. He attended a funeral of a Senator, one of these self-appointed, expectant, and hopefuls, got up close to him, and as the casket was lowered beneath the soil, the man said, Sir John, I'd like to take his place. Sir John said, I can't hear you. What did you say? He said, I'd like to take his place, Sir John. John replied, my friend, I think it's a little late now. It was not hard to like Sir John MacDonald. His humor had a way of smoothing over the roughest of circumstances. I think of the example of one of his friends. It appointed him to a position as keeper of the Rideau Canal locks, or one of the locks. This man had been addicted to liquor. He started on the job on Monday. He disappeared Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and later in the week. The question was raised in the house. He was criticized for having appointed this man. It was completely unjustified, the appointment. He said, you should have known better. Why, he hasn't been around. And in that particular lock, there's no water anymore. And Sir John said, heavens, has well started to drink canal water. And that's the way he brushed aside the criticism. Sir John could laugh at himself, and that's one of the major attributes that must be possessed by anyone in public life who occupies a position of leadership. The caricatures of him make me realize that I am only in the second class. Ben Goff was the major cartoonist. He invariably pictured Sir John with a nose slightly less in size than the head. On one occasion, Sir John was in the barber shop, and in came a liberal, and he said, well, I 
think, Sir John, that you'll agree that the only person who can tweak your nose is your barber. And old Sir John said, and if he does, he has a handful. I recall a story of R.S. White, MP, during the days that Mr. Bennett was prime minister. White, in the late 1880s, had been a member of the press gallery. And one of the stories had to do with a delegation from the city of Montreal came to Ottawa to see Sir John. Uh, the chairman of the delegation was a leading temperance man in Montreal and invariably commenced every presentation with an explanation uh, that he was, in fact, a temperance worker and had no use for anyone who at any time took a drink. Mr. White was concerned over what the reaction would be as he led in the delegation. Sir John was apparently in no mood for, for play that day. He was very cold and aloof. The chairman started in by explaining that he was a temperance man. He was sitting alongside Sir John, and Sir John looked at him and said, Sir, your breath is disgusting. It smells of water. Uh, that broke the ice. Somebody said, they tell me that you are regarded as the damnedest liar in all Canada. To which you replied, I dare say, they have foundation for that. Somebody else said of him, he's a pocket edition of Judas Iscariot, neatly bound in calf. Why calf? At a convocation of McGill University, Lord Dufferin, uh, the governor general, made the address in Greek. In those days, the classics were regarded as a prerequisite uh, to identification as an intellectual, or indeed, necessary for everyone to have a fundamental knowledge of the classics. Sir John had none of that. He had a friend in the Montreal Gazette. And the event was written up and the speech was spoken of. The reporter stated that Lord Dufferin had spoken in the most perfect Greek. What he said was the epitome of Greek. Sir Hector Langevin came along the next day in cabinet and he said, Sir John, did you read what the reporter said regarding Lord Dufferin's speech to the convocation? Yes, that reporter's a friend of yours, isn't he? Yes. Does he know any Greek? No. Well, where did he get the information for the article? He said, I told him. But he said, Prime Minister, you don't know any Greek. No, said Sir John, but I know a little about politics. I think it was 1878. He went to Washington for the purpose of assuring the protection of Canada's rights in connection with fisheries. The British thought he was an interloper. It wasn't right that a Canadian should dare turn up to even be present when treaties were being made. Sir John went. He insisted on his right to be heard, even though he wasn't listened to. About the only place he was welcome uh, was when gatherings were convened to honor the visiting delegates. He was permitted to go along. And on this particular occasion, uh, the presidential yacht was taken down the Potomac. A senator's wife sat down beside him and said, where do you come from? He said, Canada, ma'am. She went on to say, they tell me you have a smart man up there by the name of MacDonald. He replied, yes, ma'am, he is smart. But everybody says around here that he's a perfect rascal. Yes, uh, that's his reputation, a perfect rascal. 
What I'd like to ask you is this. How do you Canadians elect such a scalawag? Well, he said, they can't get along without him. A few minutes later, her husband came along and introduced his wife to Sir John. She was very embarrassed and started to apologize. Sir John said, don't apologize. Everybody in Canada believes everything that you said. There were a few examples of bitter antagonism between Sir John and those who sat opposite him. But there was one exception. Uh, Richard Cartwright had been a conservative. He left MacDonald because he did not receive the portfolio that he hoped for. He became a liberal. His antipathy to MacDonald was revealed in every speech. In the 1880s, in front of the Parliament buildings, uh, there was a high board walk with railings on each side, some four feet in width. On one occasion, MacDonald and Cartwright met face to face on the board walk. Cartwright sneered as he came abreast of MacDonald. Should I never get out of the road of scoundrels? Sir John stepped one pace to the right and replied, I always do, Sir Richard. MacDonald's life has always been a source of interest and inspiration to me. It goes back a long way. My great-grandparents the Bannermans were crofters in Sutherlandshire, in Kildonan. Fourteen miles away, the MacDonalds lived. In 1812, the Duchess of Sutherland decided that she would clear out the highlands in Sutherland. She drove them out in Kildonan. The crofters returned from a visit that was arranged on their behalf as a prelude to the destruction of their homesteads and found their homes burned down, their cattle gone, their sheep had disappeared. My great-grandfather and mother had no place to go but the new world. They were attracted by the promise that was given that in what is now the Winnipeg area would be a wonderful place to settle and start a new life. They joined the Selkirk Settlement and they arrived on the Red River in 1813. MacDonald's father and mother were driven out at the same time. They went to Glasgow, where Sir John was born in 1815. If it had not been for the Scottish clearances, the first and the 13th Prime Minister of Canada would not have been. There are some people who believe that because from day to day in the House of Commons that we clash in debate, that thereby we become bitter enemies personally, nothing of the kind. Strong men have strong opinions. They express them strongly. That's always been so. Laurier and MacDonald clashed. Yet I think the finest tribute that was ever paid to anyone in Canadian public life was that of Wilfrid Laurier as he then was, two days after the passing of Sir John. It's a great piece spoken from the heart. These are a few of the quotations from Wilfrid Laurier's words. I think it can be asserted that for the supreme art of governing men, Sir John MacDonald was gifted as few men in any land or in any age were gifted. 
gifted with the most high of all qualities, qualities which would have made him famous wherever exercised and which would have shone all the more conspicuously the larger the theater. It may be said without any exaggeration whatever that the life of Sir John MacDonald from the date he entered Parliament is the history of Canada. He was connected and associated with all the events, all the facts which brought Canada from the position Canada then occupied, the position of two small provinces having nothing in common but a common allegiance, united by a bond of paper and united by nothing else to the present state of development which Canada has reached.